Friends, good morning. Very warm welcome to our service this morning. And if you're visiting with us, we welcome you. As we see God's blessing together, we welcome you. You'll be watching the sermon recorded later at our time of worship. Thank you for your patience. We hope soon to be able to live stream, God willing, these services once again. We're going to worship God this morning, singing firstly Psalm 93, 93rd Psalm. And this is Sing Psalms. Sing Psalms 93. We can sing the whole psalm together. Find it on page 1, 2, 3. If you're using the psalm book, Psalm 93, the 93rd Psalm. The Lord is king. His throne endures majestic in his height. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength and might. The world is founded, firm and sure, removed it cannot be. Your throne is strong and you are God from all eternity. Let's sing the whole psalm, 93rd psalm. Sing psalms, the Lord is king. <laughs> the Lord is king, his throne and you Let's seek God in prayer. Let's pray. Lord our God, this morning we thank you for this time, this opportunity where we can meet, for the great privilege of coming to you in prayer, the fact that you listen to us, and the fact that you call us. And in Isaiah 64, even using that form of language, lament the fact that there is no one who stirs themselves up to lay hold upon you. The agony of wrestling with you prayerfully, spiritually going through that physical experience that Jacob met when he wrestled with you. And he wouldn't give up. For us, Lord, to persevere and, and to prevail, taking encouragement of the persistent widow who for her persistence and refusal to give up was rewarded. And sometimes the persistence and the constancy in prayer 
It's because the answer isn't coming or we don't think it's coming or we don't see it. And Lord, to know the difference and to have the wisdom to know when we're praying in your will and when we're not. Sometimes it can be clear to us. Your word spells it out other times when there may not be anything specific. We find we pray and we wait upon you and Lord, to learn the lesson of arriving at that place where irrespective of the answer is coming or not, we accept like Abraham when he was praying and he was counting down the numbers of potential righteous people in Sodom. And as he went down number by number, pleading with you to spare the whole city for the few righteous, he ended saying, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is right? And our lives are so small and insignificant. And for us before you, Lord, to realize these glorious scriptural truths apply to us. That you're speaking to us constantly in scripture to instruct and guide and to lead us. We're so slow to learn. And sometimes it's through repeated teaching that we learn. Unlike Jacob, where he was limping after that experience, wrestling physically. He went on his way limping the rest of his life, left a mark on him. And when you're working, it is exactly the same. And even if we take a long time to learn, we will certainly learn what you're saying to us. As we're about to read, whether it's Jonah running away from your will, or the disciples in your will in a boat with you in a storm. The same thing can happen for different reasons. But through all of them, we thank you that Jonah wasn't written off. But though he ran away, he had his reasons that were wrong and his frustrations that were equally wrong. But you didn't leave him. And the fact that you finished the book of Jonah with a question addressed to him, it leaves it somewhat open-ended. And we thank you, Lord, that your grace is so unique. And that when your people are walking faithfully like Job did, it doesn't mean things won't happen. And when your people may be wandering away from you, we thank you, Lord, for all that you so kindly may send to bring them and to bring us, as we're all part of this, to bring us back. David said it in the 23rd Psalm, that you restored his soul, that you made him to walk again in righteous paths. He, like he said in Psalm 119, he said to you, I like a lost sheep went astray. Your servant, seek and find. And Lord, we thank you for the gospel in so many respects. How it applies to your people and they never get past it. And even maybe through the, the learning and deepening understanding of our hearts before you and of our, our need of your grace and power and keeping. We thank you, Lord, for the fact that we can, if we can at all, identify with what's written in your word. It is to you we come. It is to you we look. We have nothing to offer. We have nothing to bring. And the gospel rings us through for us now as it ever did. Maybe, in fact, that isn't the, the thing. To say. It, it's more so now than ever. But sometimes it's in places of non-attainment and uh, feeling maybe always reaching forward to what we can't get hold of. That's what Paul, your servant, was feeling. But he said, uh, not that I had already attained this or were already perfect, but this one thing I do. He said that he would be stretching out, striving after the prize of the upward the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. That despite everything about himself and about life and even about your kingdom, he had that essential thing at heart. When he came to the end of his life, he said it to Timothy that uh, he was already being poured out as a drink offering. That he said that he had fought a good fight. He had finished the course and he had kept the faith. And that there was now laid up for him the crown of righteousness, which you, the perfect, the righteous judge, would give him in that day unto all those who love your appearing. 
And so, O oh Lord, to see that whatever life holds or seems to hold or not hold just now or at any time, that we may see the power and the focus and the necessity of the gospel as in a world and with, with bodies and in an environment that is fallen and disintegrating. Your servant Paul looked at himself in that regard as someone whose body was a tent or clothes, a tent one day ready to be taken down, clothes one day to be laid aside, only to be further clothed. This body, as he tells the Philippians, this earthly, this lowly body, shall be made like unto your glorious body, even by the power with which you're able to subdue everything to yourself. If we stop for just a moment to consider what you're actually doing in our lives, it's too much. But for the time and the ability to think and, and understand something and to see and have insight, to see the realities of this coming age and to see what is invisible, as you are the one Moses saw. He saw, you tell us in Hebrews 11, him who is invisible. And for your reality and presence and power, even now these few moments we're around your word together, that you will speak to us, every one of us here. Thank you, Lord, for the health and strength and circumstances that have made it possible for us to be here today. We remember others are at home or at work or away just now. We pray for all who are connected here. We remember as well those who have been using um, the, the live stream function. We're very mindful of them, Lord, and the fact that it's one of these things in your providence we meet. We pray that it may be possible to sort and fix with the wisdom and uh, the provision that's needed where uh, people who know these things and uh, anyone we may bring to to look at it we ask for guidance and we thank you for this means and for everyone who's involved in behind the scenes arranging so much that happens that people don't see and and when things maybe don't work out it's then we really notice or but lord we pray for your blessing the sense of privilege and calling to everyone here in the congregation everyone who who is uh, working and everyone who is laboring behind the scenes there are praying people and lord we need more than anything not 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 uh, in replacing everything but above everything we have to call to you we have to pray and with us for the the nearness the glorious reality of your presence it's like someone like israel when they were well, Moses, when he was leading Israel and at the bottom of Sinai with the golden calf incident that Aaron had made and the idolatry and everything that followed. And you said to Moses that you would send an angel before them. An angel would lead them into the promised land and dispossess the peoples and would give them the land flowing with milk and honey. But Moses said, if your presence does not go with me, do not take us from here. And your people know that whenever they face something, even facing a new day, a new situation, it is for your nearness and the reality of your presence. And so may that be true as we meet here and as we've met with the family through the week in uh, mourning, Lord, as we mourn the passing of one of our own who has served you so faithfully for so long and we are praying lord for the generation that's coming makes us think as we've heard and hear older christians themselves praying so often and the young ones here were christians no doubt we've been we've been prayed for and maybe for years without us knowing it before coming to faith as an encouragement lord as we pray for those who are coming in the generation that's rising a very difficult time challenging and needing the wisdom, and needing the understanding, and the vision, and all that's necessary to bring your word before this generation. And Lord, we thank you for every means uh, of broadcasting and sharing your word in, in different places and into different contexts. We thank you your word is revealed 
to us in our own language. We need your help to understand and to have that spiritual understanding and that divine illumination of heart and mind that we would recognize that these are the words of the living God and more than that, that we would come like Peter did. And he said in John, in John 6, he said, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we have come to know and to believe that you are the Christ and that you are the Son of God. May we know you. Remember all in need, we pray, that you will give healing, Lord, that you will give recovery and restoration of health. Lord, that you will remember those whose um, struggles are hidden and behind, as it were, what we can see on the outside. We pray, Lord, for those who are struggling, who are going through trials and tribulations and tests, and people who maybe feel alone in them and, and are struggling in that aspect too. May they be assured, even now, of your presence and the fact that you are with them and your words bring in joy, light, and peace like no human words can. So, Lord, remember us, we pray, your blessing on this time giving thanks for this opportunity again and praying that you will lead us as we seek to sing, to read, and to meditate upon your holy word. May in your providence this be the word that you have set before us today as we all of us come and we seek to humble ourselves. Like James said, that we are to receive with meekness the word that is able to save our souls. May it be so that we have the right heart before you undertake for us and lead us into your service and worship as we wait upon you and ask everything. In Jesus' name, for his sake. Amen. Well, let's turn to Psalm 107. We'll be singing twice from this psalm just now and then our concluding singing. Now, this is in Scottish Psalter, Psalm 107. And we're going to sing from verse 22. Find this on page 384. 384. The 107th Psalm. Maybe tell from the Psalms the reference is to swelling and raging seas. Psalm 107, verse 22. And let them sacrifice to him offerings of thankfulness, and let them show abroad his works in songs of joyfulness, who go to sea in ships and in great waters trading be. Within the deep, these men God's works and his great wonders see. It's singing to verse 28 from verse 22, Psalm 107. And let them sacrifice to
Lord's turn to read together, we can turn firstly to the book of Jonah and the first two chapters, Jonah chapters 1 and 2, not the easiest book in the Old Testament to find among the minor prophets, but firstly Jonah 1 and 2 and then we're going to read some verses in Mark chapter 4, Jonah 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with him to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, And there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship, and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us, that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know on whose account this evil has come on us, upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you've done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, The men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep. Into the heart of the seas and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. Yet I shall look again upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my, about my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with a voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. The Lord spoke to the fish. And it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. And if you come forward as well, please, to Mark chapter 4. It's the last section from verse 35. Mark 4, verse 35. This is where we want to focus, Lord willing, shortly, with reference to Jonah as we go along. Mark chapter 4, verse 35. On that day... When evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. 
And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So on. May God bless our readings from his word. We turn now to Psalm 89. Scottish Psalter 89. And from verse 5, this is page 344 in the books. 344. Psalm 89 at verse 5. Down to verse 9. The praises of thy wonders, Lord, the heavens shall express. And in the congregation of saints, thy faithfulness. For who in heaven with the Lord may once himself compare? Who is like God among the sons of those that mighty are? Let's sing to verse 9 from verse 5. Psalm 89, the praises of thy wonders, Lord. The praises of thy wonders, Lord, the heavens shall express, and in the congregation of saints for God's blessing and his help as we consider his word together. Let's turn to our reading there in Mark, Mark chapter 4. If we read again the last verse, verse 41. In fact, yes, verse 41. And they, were told, were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this? 
that even the wind and the sea obey him. One of the lessons that um, we can learn in life, hard lessons to learn, is learning what we can do. When you're growing up, there's so much pressure, there's so much happening where, you know, it's, it's almost expected that you, beca- that you become a certain kind of person. And the important thing is that as an old elder once said to a, a young Christian who's an older Christian than me, I remember him saying it to me, passing on the information. You maybe know who this elder, he was in Stornoway, and he said, Cove, he said, be yourself. That's what he said to him, be yourself. The person God has made you, the best who that is, by God's grace. And that can involve not looking at other people and trying to be like them. It's always good to have a good kind of role model Jesus is the ultimate. Christians and the Christians in Thessalonica were, were told that they became examples. Paul says to them, you became examples of us and of the Lord. So wanting to be like people isn't a bad thing where these people are great examples. And uh, it's possible as well to remember maybe things that happened in your life or things an older person said to you that didn't make sense at the time. But when you look back, you realize and um, while children often think their parents are from, you know, the dark ages, whatever you want to call them, and haven't a clue about anything, well, maybe themselves and you growing up, there's things you won't understand just now, or maybe won't make sense, but later on, they'll make perfect sense. And one of these things, this probably doesn't make any sense to, to when you're growing up, it, it probably doesn't, because it's, uh, you, you can have such a carefree and such a good and a bright future ahead of you to plan and prayerfully ask God's guidance and blessing on your life. But with the pressures that are on, it's so important to accept who you're not. I then I'll have to say something. I was given a t-shirt um, by family, people who know you best, and it said something. And, and how, how would you take this? It's accepting who you're not. How would a man take this? If it isn't broken, this said, I'll fix it until it is. You know, and that's where some people can see things about you. And you've maybe heard it said, I remember it was a session meeting and another church denomination student and was in Stornoway. An anonymous letter came to one of the elders and he raised it. Oh, he was was heartbroken. And whether anyone thought there was any reason to say what was said or there was never any reason to send it anonymously. didn't have the guts to come and say it to him at all. But what they said was this, to see ourselves as others see us. It crushed him. Now, the session knew who'd written the letter. But, you know, that's just by the side and whatever came from all of that. But the problem is, it doesn't in one sense matter how people view you. So long as you're putting the Lord first and trying to walk in his ways and trying to copy him. And not worrying if you don't feel accepted, maybe. The Lord will take care of you. You see, the fear of man, the Proverbs tells us, brings a snare. That's what we're trying to get at. Not making your life fit into other people's expectations of you. But be yourself. Be the person that the Lord will have you be the, the person the Lord has made you to be and the best that you can be by his grace. Jonah, someone who was afraid, he was afraid that God was going to bless the Ninevites. Sounds very strange. You try and get into his way of thinking. You know, when the cogs are turning and here's this man, a prophet, and his life calling is to announce to people that there is a way of salvation and to call the people back the people of God back to his ways. Jonah, the son of Amittai, that was his calling. But he could see, or thought he could see, he actually could, that with Nineveh being spared and not being judged by God, the outcome would be that Israel would be punished by the Assyrians as a result of their unfaithfulness to God. And Jonah could see it. You know, you think you have your finger on the pulse. 
Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote a book, a powerful book, Knowing the Times. There's almost a prophetic insight, not being telling the future, but seeing where things are. And we have to remember that about Jonah. Whatever we would say about Jonah, and we could say a lot, and we'd say less when we see ourselves, as it were, walking uh, in his shoes and, and, and um, trying to work things out in his life and, and trying to wrestle with God's will the wrong way. There can be uh, difficulties, there can be challenges, but to figure out how someone can go so against God, like completely against God's express, clear calling on his life. Well, the fact that it's possible, you know, it's like somebody had said, it was actually John Newton. If you get a hold of some of John Newton's works, I can remember if there are five, I think six volumes of Anne of Truth published them. And one of them he does, it's got a specific title, but he, he, um, he gives an account of like early church history, so in the Gospels and Acts, and he gives some comments. And one of the things he writes, I never forgot this, was with Judas Iscariot. And he asked the question, why, why well, there's lots of answers, um, God's will and God's prophecy in the Old Testament about Judas, that he was going to come and do what he did. But the question, why did it happen? Why is, not just why did it happen, why is it written for us? And John Newton was saying, very thought-provoking, he said, so that we wouldn't be surprised if we see a similar thing happen. Does that make sense? When somebody follows in a sense in these kind of footsteps, they can't commit the same sins. They call the unpardonable sin, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. You see it in Matthew, I think it's 12, 13, but Hebrews 6 makes it very clear. The impossibility of someone going down a certain road, of rejecting Christ after professing. This isn't backsliding, but making that profession. It's not even Jonah running away from God. That isn't it. A Christian can go very far. A genuine born-again man or woman can go very far from God. And God can leave them to do that. But he won't leave them permanently. With Jonah, he sent the storm. And... Uh, not just the storm. We, we, we sometimes think about, oh, well, the storm and he was thrown into the sea. But really began to happen to Jonah when he was in the water. We read that. And there's just noticing this with a view to considering the disciples and, and their experience. Because they are completely in God's will. Being on that boat at that time on that lake. Jonah's on the run. And he is going the complete opposite geographically and intentionally from God. What would you do with him? You, what, what, what do you think about someone like Jonah? What do I think about someone like Jonah? Or how did you think about Jonah? Do you criticize him? It's, it's, it's not that he's, he's doing the right thing, running away. It, and criticizing him isn't wrong. So far as we're not condemning someone. You know, in the sense that when we're very quick to say something about someone in that moment whether we realize it or not, we don't believe we'd do it ourselves. Or else we wouldn't say it. We wouldn't criticize someone for doing wrong unless we thought ourselves immune to it. Peter said, they, they all might deny you, but not me. Who's the, one that, who's the one that did it? The one who thought he couldn't actually do it. He thought the weakness in everyone else was enough to say, oh, you know, all of these, though all men forsake you, the tragedy of it. But see, the Lord didn't give up. The Lord, not, not give up, that the, the Lord had begun a work in Peter that he was going to see through. And he was doing a work in Jonah that he was going to see through. He's doing a work in every one of his people that he's going to see through. And a lot can happen in the way. The way of holiness. The way of uh, the path. Read in Psalm 23, the paths of righteousness. Have you ever followed somewhat in the footsteps of Jonah? You know what God is saying to you. Sometimes... You maybe, we maybe wish we knew clearer about other things in life. But maybe something specific. And, um, you know, the Lord's telling you to do it. You don't want to do it. And you do it. And have you found blessing in the doing it? You find what you thought you'd never find. Just obeying it. Going, going, whatever it is. There could be so many examples. Remember a situation that years ago. Forgive me speaking so much about self. And this was a man up, in, up at the top of... A, it doesn't matter where it was, but I saw this man coming and being in a, in a hurry um, to get to a place, thinking, I, I, 
I can't stop. And I had to, I had to, couldn't turn around, couldn't, you know, not trying to avoid someone for the sake, but because of a time. But meeting that person who was a Christian man, an older man, and he, he wasn't the, the brightest in ways. I say that respectfully. But, you know, what a blessing there was just listening to that man talk. And we, you know, can put blessings away in a situation when the Lord is putting them right in front of us. And we think this, that the Lord is saying, I want you to talk to this person. I want you to, I want you to go there. I want you to listen to that or, or whatever it is. And we might say no. Struggling is okay when the struggle is trying to understand what God is saying to you. The struggle isn't good when you know what he's saying to you already. I'll hear what God the Lord will speak, Psalm 85, to his folk. He'll speak peace to his saints, but let them not return to foolishness. Psalm 34, he say, uh, 32, isn't it? I'll instruct and teach you the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. And he said, so don't be like the horse or the mule. Don't kick out about this. Don't be the person who needs me to put the bridle on them and force them in the direction I want them to go. Now, all of that maybe sounds quite uh, unnerving to think if we are in any way out of God's will that the Jonah situation is going to happen. God knows all of us perfectly, doesn't he? One thing, he will make us hear what he's going to say. He'll make us hear what he's going to say. But it may be the case that he will leave us if we try to insist on our own way. I think that's what we see in Jonah. Well, why didn't, why didn't God stop people? Why did he send, not send a prophet as soon as Jonah thought, well, I'm going to run away and I am, I'm not going to Nineveh. I'm going the opposite direction. I'm going to get a boat another way. You think, would God send people to stop him? He doesn't always do that. And we see something happening and we think, oh, well, something's going to going to be a big something there and we don't know that we're not God it's not to be an encouragement or a comfort you like to incline us to go away from God at all but if we're on that path and if we're we're at that place of, of going away and maybe the storm has come and we're realizing the Lord is speaking to us well listen to him we have to listen to him and just think about the fact that he is pursuing Jonah who's on the run. He's trying to get away, noticing from the presence of the Lord, the place of blessing, the place of fellowship with God. Not that there's one location that, that God would, would be present and not present in other places. It's language that's used by, I think it's first used by, um, by Cain, the Garden of Eden. The Lord was revealing himself at that location. And so by being driven away from the presence of the Lord, there's a literal sense where Cain was putting himself away from fellowship with God, and all that that means, the blessings involved in it. But we need to remind ourselves, don't we, with Jonah's prayer. We often think of him running away, and how could someone be so rebellious and kicking and fighting and and all of that? But then it's when we see the real man coming out, coming to himself, public shame. Public shame. And here is this man having to admit to heathen ungodly. You can imagine, you know, if you could hear what they were saying and the way they were saying it. Um, it wouldn't very likely have been calm at all. And even the captain coming to wake Jonah up. Jonah sound asleep, as you know. But the fact that he's got to now admit, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the God of heaven. And this has all happened because of me. Because I'm fleeing from him, from his presence. I mean, what a witness is that? What kind of testimony to heathen and ungodly sailors? Well, it's not a good one. It's a very, very compromised one. And they try and do the maths, as it were, and say, well, you should be there because you serve this God and he's calling you there, but now you're here. Imagine the pain of having to say, I know. It's not that Jonah didn't know what he was doing. It's the fact that he did. But the Lord did a great work in him in the depths of the sea. Jonah was dying, actually dying. He was losing consciousness and he was way down. But he's praying, isn't he? And he has hope in that prayer. Yet I will look upon your holy dwelling. And he also says, I will pay my vows. 
And he's at the bottom of the sea before the fish swallows him. See, faith begins to emerge. Isn't God amazing? Where do you think Jonah should have been left? Where do you think you and I should have been left? Where we deserve to have been left? But grace is where God is reaching to us. Even in our Christian lives, like with Jonah, this, is, this isn't a person who's running away from God. Or like Adam after the fall trying to hide in the trees. This is a man of God. This is a prophet of God. Running from the God who's sending him to bring salvation to thousands. It doesn't make sense until we see the way Jonah's thinking. Even then, what Jonah's thinking, he's saying, I want this. This is going to happen. But God is wanting something else. And he insists on his own way. Does he not know God? Has he not learned enough? Of course he knows God. But this is the, this is the reality, isn't it? The way what we feel and what we think can go opposite directions. Considering these, these disciples on, on the storm, you see, they face a predicament. They end up in a storm. If you compare the other Gospels, you'll see different contexts and situations, things happening when this um, calming of this first instance, there's two of them, of the Lord calming the storm. This time he's with them. The other time he comes walking on the sea. But Matthew's account has a content. It just depends. It varies. Some people think Matthew organizes his material thematically. It doesn't matter. It's God's guidance and the whole process of inspiration that leads to that. But it's a different context here in Mark from what you have in Matthew. And it's seeing things from different perspectives, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But we're told on that day when the evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took with him they took him with them in the boat just as he was and other boats were with him. So there's a little fleet of disciples and they're going across to the other side. They're in his will. He's saying, do this, go here, come with me on this boat, on the sea. What could be more simple or straightforward? Obeying him and the way the Lord was and is. Of course he is. It's where people discover him. They don't want to be parted from him. Where Peter's saying that to, when, when he says to, to, to the disciples early in John, to whom, to whom to, will you also go away? They say, Peter's saying, we can't go away. Who else will we go to? You have the words of eternal life. We've discovered you. We've met you. We've known you. You've shown us that you are the Son of God, that you are the Christ. There's no going anywhere. There's no looking for anyone else. And it's the same, isn't it? And you can imagine the people all flocking, coming. The crowds are left, but the disciples were told on one boat and other boats that are with them, they go to make their way across. I wonder what they were thinking. It's evening. They're going to spend time with him again. They'll have him to themselves. He's been busy preaching and teaching the crowds, the parables in the preceding section, and now they're on their way to the next location but a storm comes and this is the thing but it can be so confusing when you're doing not like Jonah doing your own will and running away and, but when you're in the place and in the circumstance that God wants you to be in it doesn't mean things won't become problematic it doesn't mean things can't um, fall apart and it doesn't mean that we won't even hit panic and, and panic is what happens to them they're scared people who are used to the sea they're used to it you can think of uh, Peter and Andrew, his brother, and James and John, people. They're used to this. They could, you know, when Jesus rebukes the Pharisees, they could read the sky. They could tell how the weather was going to be, and so they knew. But sudden windstorms coming down on Galilee for the, because of the, 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 the way the, 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 um, the land is can happen very quickly and very much out of the ordinary. But this was a completely extraordinary storm to them. Because, you know, the, you, people who, who've been at sea often, they, they know they know a storm, and uh, they know a real storm. And this was a real storm. This is something they weren't used to because they were at their wit's end. Like Psalm 107, they were really scared, walking in God's way, and then something happens you're not prepared for, and you can't cope with or deal with yourself. What do you do? This is Christians. These are people, men of God. See, the Lord is teaching them, isn't he? He's teaching Jonah in the depths of the sea. 
He's teaching these disciples out in the midst of the Sea of Galilee. Different situation, different lessons, similar circumstances. So you hit a storm out at sea and do you then think, I must be Jonah? Is that the way your mind works? What does God think of me? What, what's he saying to me in this situation? Is this happening because I'm rebelling or is this happening for some other reason? We're very unlikely to think that things go wrong in our lives because, you know, naturally we don't think it like because of our situation is like that of Job. When the Lord is saying, look at him. And Satan says, he put a hedge around his life. I know how to make him curse you to your face. Didn't, didn't happen. But we look at, at, at Job and we think, well, category of his own. Unless we look at others and we can see the Lord loves, you know, he loves all his people. But you, there are some people who really suffer, really suffer in their Christian lives. And that person might ask why. But you can look on. And reading, as in, isn't it... Um, Hebrews 12, that whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And it's an expression and an indication of the love of God for his people when they are tried and when they are tested. That doesn't mean it's nice. It doesn't mean that people sit in this kind of zone and, and like sanctification takes place with nothing happening. It's often through things, isn't it? Hard and difficult things. That sanctification, of progression in holiness, whatever way we think of it, whatever we understand of anything, Christ-likeness, godliness. You know, it says that bit in Hebrews 12, that no chastening for the present time is, is it's not pleasant, it's grievous. Nevertheless, it yields, he says, the peaceable fruit of righteousness, the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who are exercised by it. And our earthly fathers, the writer says, they chastened us uh, for their pleasure, as the old Bible puts it, not quite the, the translation, but, but he does it, we're told, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. You know, the destiny God has and the means God uses sometimes defy our logic and explanation. That's maybe where he wants us, where we can't understand and we accept that we can't understand. We're not wrestling to understand or define or have it all qualified and understood so that we know when it's going to change. We know the outcome. We know the time. None of that. But being out at sea in a storm, I mean, the Lord rebukes the disciples. And by the rebuke, he says to them, verse 40, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? They're afraid because their faith isn't active. But you can see that that situation is one in which they shouldn't have been afraid because they should have been believing. Uh, it's easy to say that. It's easy to say that. And when the storm comes, it's very difficult, isn't it? You don't have a footing. You feel you've got nowhere to stand on. And maybe feeling that prayer and, and, and understanding of providence. I mean, these things, sometimes these things go, can we say, out the window. You can't think straight, never mind at a moment, pray. panic, blind panic, where everything just smothers faith and smothers hope, and you just try and ride out that storm. But the Lord can reach into that situation. And doesn't he do it wonderfully? Because he's sound asleep on the boat. Mark tells us he's got a, what a picture. You try and picture this. You try and see him, not, not in any, any way that you need to visualize, but you do. We, 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 you know, and he, the picture Mark gives us with the details that he's so used to giving in his gospel, he says he's lying on a sleep on a cushion in the stern. He's sound asleep. Complete opposites. Jonah sound asleep for his reasons. The Lord was exhausted, absolutely exhausted. We're told in John four that that was another time when walking from place to place, he went through Samaria. We're told that uh, he was wearied with his journey. He had been investing himself in, in, in the previous situation in, in uh, teaching the people about the parable of the sower, the basket, the seed, the mustard seed, and then they're on the boat in the store. He's exhausted. It's through humanity. He understands these extremities of, of human experience. His were sinless and... Um, not, Ours are, are different, of course. Sinless, we mean by that in, in, 
in, uh, the, the, in, in his experience and in his interaction. He was always, always doing the Father's will in thought, in word, in action, which would have made the trials and the tests all the more weighty, all the more difficult. You think of our Lord there, and he is experiencing, is he not, what he said Adam would go through for a different reason. Our Lord is the sin bearer. He isn't committing sin in any shape or form. And our sins being transferred to him, he remains personally innocent while representatively guilty. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Not only that, we're told, we're told in, in uh, Matthew's account of this, in a preceding section where the Lord is healing, he's healing the centurion's son and uh, the servant, and, he's, and he heals Pete, Peter's mother-in-law, among others. And we're told there's a quotation. Matthew, Matthew does this with some Old Testament references. He quotes from Isaiah 53, and he says, he took on him our sicknesses or our illnesses, which isn't what Isaiah is saying, that he has carried our sins, borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. But I think Matthew is telling us that all the consequences, all the judgment, all that is signified by sin as being by its very nature against God, he took, he carried, he bore, and he suffered for it. And it's not that he became sick with our sicknesses, but that the cause of our sicknesses was upon him. Sin and guilt. Adam was told in the, that, that, that the sweat of his brow he would eat bread. He's going to be exhausted, working from day to day. The Lord as a sin bearer, sinless in himself, must have been some experience. We'd have no idea. The angels have no idea. The sinless angels don't know. They observe and they look with wonder at all of this. We're told by Peter that the angels desire to look into it. But they panic. And in their panic, they pray. And their prayer is, well, it says everything about their state of mind. They say, Lord, they woke him up. They say, Lord, do you not, teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Do you not care? What do you think about us? And what they're saying basically is, if you really cared for us, this wouldn't be happening. So why is this all happening? And the questions go to, maybe not so much the Lord, but to ourselves. What does he think of me? I heard of a, a, an American Christian man, a man who was, he was having a really hard thing. I mentioned this before. It doesn't matter who it was, but uh, a, a Christian man, a believing man, and going through a really difficult patch. And he was driving, and, you know, when he was praying, he was saying, uh, he said, Lord, do you even love me? And when he said that, you know, when he was talking about, you wouldn't think maybe, that, that that could happen. But maybe, maybe you can identify with that. The biggest questions. Isn't that what they're saying? Do you not care? How does that make him feel? Of course he cares. He's, he's, he's going to make this a tremendous blessing in their lives because through it, the end of the, the, the section, the end of the chapter, is they come to discover him in a way they'd never discovered him before. Never. To the point that they're saying, who is this? Meaning, he's not who we thought he was. He's more than what we, we ever thought he was. But the reason for, for all of that, of course, is when they wake him up, and when he, we're told in verse 39, rebukes the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still, the wind ceased. There was a great calm, not just a calm, there was a, an unusual calm. The storm was unusual, and the calm was as equally unusual. And they are completely at a loss. He rebukes them. Why are you so afraid? Or he says elsewhere, why are you fearful, O oh, you of little faith? See, the two things go together. The more we're afraid, the less we have faith. The more we have faith, the less we'll be afraid. That, that's easy to say. But see, the lesson the Lord is giving these disciples is the fact of his presence with them. It doesn't matter what's going on. That's easy to say too. But there they are. And their lives are at risk. 
And if things carry on the way they're going, there's only one outcome on the storm raging. So do we maybe try and accuse them of praying the wrong way or or do we with the Lord say, why are you so afraid? Or do we find ourselves able to worship God as well and realize he is the one who brings these amazing calms into storms. He can do it. And he can change. He isn't finished with it. He can change us. It's a gradual change. But do you believe that he can actually change you? You're maybe your biggest problem. If you're a Christian, you will be. But the Lord has an amazing way of changing. Not just the way you think about something. It's a wonderful thing. But to actually change who you are. You'll still be you, but you'll be a changed you. That happens when one is born again. But also in, in, in that whole experience of the Christian life, you can come across a Christian who through something that God has sent their way has almost become converted all over again. Almost. The Lord isn't finished with the disciples. He's going to meet them again on the sea, but he's not going to be with them. They're going to be in his will. He's going to send them across, and he's going to come walking on the waves of the sea. An even greater experience. You can see the progression maybe in what the Lord is doing with these disciples. He's with them the first time. He's not with them the second time. And when you go through something and you realize, I've been, it's not the deja vu feeling, it's not that kind of thing, but you realize Maybe it is a kind of feeling of, I've been in the, not in this situation, but this kind of thing has happened. The next time round, you'll maybe be less and less of a panic. You'll be more calm. And when the thing comes round again, you realize, I know what this is. It still won't maybe be easy, but you'll understand. This is the doing of the Lord. Wondrous in our eyes. We want to come to that place of persuasion where they are saying, who is this? They're filled with amazement. They're filled with awe. Don't give up or look upon the situations in your life as being meaningless. When the Lord is sending you something, he's going to meet you in it. He'll meet with all of us. And when he tries us, he says, Job said, when I, he has tried me, I will come forth like gold, like him. Wonderful thought. The outcome of trials, even like Jonah, when the trial is self-inflicted, don't give up hope. The Lord put Jonah on the dry land again the way he did it. And Jonah made his errors again, but... The Lord has the last word. And it's a question, the book of Jonah. And it's an open-ended question in one sense that Jonah doesn't get a chance to answer. We can only hope that by the end of the book, he says, Lord, you're right and I'm wrong. Are you there yourself? Submitting completely to when the Lord is speaking to you and when you know, you must just give up, stop fighting and yield to his will. And yield to what he's saying. And the blessings will come. You've got to believe that. Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Let's pray just now. Let's pray. Lord our God, we thank you. Do you have this privilege of reading and trying to consider your word together? Guide us in our understanding and May the Holy Spirit, who alone can understand, explain, and reveal the truth to our hearts and minds, may he do this. And may your word find that place in our hearts as we continue before you. In Jesus' name, amen. We turn to Psalm 107 one last time. Second time, turn to 107, Scottish Psalter, and to verse 29. It's on page 384, 384, and it's Psalm 107, verse 29. The storm is changed into a calm at his command and will. 
so that the waves which raged before now quiet are and still. Let's sing to verse 32 from verse 29. Psalm 107. The storm is changed into a calm at his command and will, so that the waves which raged before now. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.